<laughs> We're going to do a lot of work tonight with something called Queez and Air Rods, and maybe some of you are familiar with them, but uh, a lot of you probably didn't go to school <laughs> using them. So I'm going to do a little quick debriefing here. We're going to do a quick introduction, then you're going to go off to either this side or this side and, and do some exploration. We'll come back, and then I have a couple activities to show you. So this is what I have planned for you today. I'll just get rid of it. Hopefully we're going to talk a little bit about a quick image activity, and I'll share that in a little while, but that's something we do on a regular basis. I want to talk to you about number name, which is something that happens across the lower school, second, third, fourth grade, every morning. If they don't get to it in the morning, they do it at some point in the day, but the kids are doing math as soon as they get to school. And then one of my favorite games, which is a game that works with Queens and Air Rods, is called How Long, How Many. We're going to play it after you get exposed to the rods a little bit, and then I'm going to ask you to come back and tell me where the math is. Hopefully you'll, you'll be able to see it. I want to talk to you about trains and the beginning of place value. Because that's something that is really, really big in third grade. Understand that a 65 is a 60 and a 5, not just a 6 and a 5. That leads us into the traditional algorithms where you're carrying. Right? We get rid of that idea of 6 and 5 in the ones place is 11. I write down the 1, I carry the 1. Ooh, math teachers squeal because you're not carrying a 1. You're actually carrying a 10. 11 is a 10 and a 1. So we try to begin that language so that they get the foundation, the conceptual understanding, so that stuff is easy for them. And then, if there's time, I want to talk to you a little bit about the homework assignment I sent home, because I did hear from a couple of parents that they were a little concerned that kids had trouble with it, and I think that's great that they had trouble with it. It was a challenge. And I heard from some parents that they were busy working on it too, and they had trouble with it. That's great. <laughs> that's the most important part, that you're actually there doing it with your kids. So, before we go off to uh, do the quiz and air rods, let's do the... the um, Quick image, real quick. Okay, so we've been busy trying to establish classroom norms in our classroom. Uh, you know, not calling out answers, not laughing when people make mistakes, that sort of thing. One of the things that happens in second, third, and fourth grade is we, we try to get rid of the whole hand raising idea. Now, obviously, if we're not talking about math and they're asking questions, that works, but when we're asking kids to do some thinking, we get rid of the hand raising and we replace it with something a little bit quieter, a little bit more subtler, which is a thumb on their chest. And the idea is, is that when I ask a question, there's usually one or two or three kids that come into class like this. The, the oo oohs, right? The ones that come at me like this the whole time. And that gets really distracting for the rest of the learners. And a lot of times, when a kid's doing this, um, it's permission for the rest of the thinkers to just kind of shut off. Oh, I don't have to do any more thinking because so-and-so's got the answer. The teacher's going to call on him, so they shut down. When you put a thumb on your chest and you're very quiet about it, it's a quiet communication with me that the kids, unless they're really turning their heads, don't really know who's ready to answer and who's not. So our system is you have an answer that you're ready to share and you're ready to articulate with the class. For the kids who need it, there is, I've double checked my answer and I'm absolutely sure, please call on me, please call on me. And then there's always a touching of your nose, which means I need a little bit more time. This is a quick image and I didn't see it as fast. So I'm going to ask you guys to participate now, and that's what you'll do. You have an answer, you've double-checked it, okay, or you're thinking. Now, your kids seem to think that this means they'll get called on first. So a lot of them skip this step and they go right to this. I completely bypass them because it's impossible to double-check if you didn't check it the first time, right? There's also a lot of this, which defeats the purpose. So they're still learning this, okay? But basically, I'm going to show you something right up here. Okay, I've got this little blinder feature which allows me to slide left and right. It allows me to slide up and down. And you're going to see something. It's going to be quick. I'm going to ask you how many you see. It's not going to be difficult. It's supposed to be pretty manageable at first. The idea is, I'm going to show you a couple of things later on. They're going to get a little bit more difficult. But using what you saw earlier, you hopefully will be able to mentally construct an answer. So right here is where you're looking. Yes. Three. Three. How'd you see three? I saw three little bars. You saw three little bars. Did anybody see it differently? This is one uh, question I try not to ask too often because that can take up 20 minutes, right? We, we can't. It's got to be a quick activity. But you saw a group of three. Okay. Some kids will say, "Oh, I saw two and one," or "I saw one and two. Your brains, though, pretty much see that right away and know that that's three. I think. It's called subitizing. You don't really have to count them one by one. You see that that's three. So you're right. It's three, no matter how you saw it. Oh, there we go. Okay, now we're looking up here. I want to know how many you see now. Mm 
remember, you always have this option. And anybody who can't see, I apologize, you can come closer. Anybody with nose? Ah, excellent, there's a nose. I always look for the noses. And for those people who are ready, this is your opportunity to double check. So you're always, you're always part of it, okay? Yes, what did you see? 11. Can you explain how you saw 11? 3, 5, and 3. How does 3, 5, and 3 make 11? Uh, 3, 5, and 8 is 3. Okay, so you did it how you saw it. 3, 3 and 5 make 8, and then 3 more make 11. Anybody see something else? In the back, yeah. 3, 3, so 6 and 11. You saw 3 and 3 to make 6, and then 6 and 5 make 11. Okay, anybody else? I saw three, three, and four. Three, three, and four. So what would, what would your ten. answer? Ten. Okay. Does three, three, and four make ten? Yes. Okay. So your math is absolutely perfectly right. That's great. <laughs> and that's, that's a really important distinction. We're going to talk about that in a second. Any other answers? Okay. So the reveal is, ah, you had an aha moment. You made a mistake. But her mistake was not her math. Her mistake is what she saw. Right? Her math is absolutely solid. She saw 3, 3, and 4, and that's 10. This is something that Austin talks a lot about in second grade, this idea of tally. Okay? I could certainly make 11 like this. But there's a huge flaw in that, right? Going back and counting it later. If I've got to count 11 things, well, that's 11 opportunities for me to make a mistake. Your brain sees this and knows that that's a 5 should. That, that diagonal means five. So depending on how you saw it, maybe it was three and three and five, or maybe it was three, five, and three, it's 11. 